Good evening and welcome to the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandungwa Kumalo, and today we're on episode 13 of the Private Property Podcast, and we're on day 33 of the lockdown. I actually had to do a mental count of how long we've all been at home. And on today's evening, uh, on this evening's show, rather, I'm joined by Nicholas Brody, who's the financial director at S-L-L-R. And we're going to be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on sectional title schemes. Now, a number of us are probably staying in sectional title schemes or maybe even have properties in sectional title schemes. And of course, this lockdown has had an effect in either the way that we're living, the way that the trustees might want to conduct their business or other aspects of our living. Uh, so to help us unpack this, uh, Nicholas will be joining us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening, Nicholas. Good evening. Thanks for having me. I think before we even get to, you know, some of the, the meatier questions of sectional title schemes and how they're potentially uh, affected by this lockdown, maybe let's just start with some of our viewers who may not know what sectional title schemes are. I mean, I think many people might be staying in, in a setup like that, but might not know what exactly it is. So if you could just take us through what exactly are sectional title schemes. Okay, so, so obviously a, a sectional title scheme is a specific arrangement which has been established in terms of the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act, okay, where owners who purchase within the uh, particular scheme obviously uh, derive ownership of a particular unit and usually attached to that, there's obviously an indivisible portion of the common property of the particular scheme and there may be additional things that are attached to that which are specific use areas for those individual owners that are attached to the particular portion that they owe within the, uh, own within this. And I mean, if you could just take us through, I'll say how they are typically run. I mean, I'm a trustee in, in some of the, the, the buildings or even complexes where I own, but perhaps, you know, to our viewers at home, if you can just take us through how they, they run. Um, I mean, who gets elected, for example, to be a trustee? Because that probably brings me to the next thing around the AGMs, which is where we elect, you know, those particular trustees. But firstly, how they are actually run. Sure, sure. So, so obviously, um, uh, there's there's sort of two phases for for sectional schemes. The first would be obviously there's a developer which develops the scheme initially, um, and they are the ones that are that are called to obviously do the first meeting uh, once a particular unit in that scheme has been sold off to another owner. Okay, and essentially that starts off the the annual general meetings which you mentioned, um, and thereafter there should be a annual general meeting which occurs and at that annual general meeting, essentially a board of trustees okay, are elected um, and the, they are the ones who essentially make the decisions for the running of the particular scheme within a particular year. Um, and they do that running within the rules that are canvassed for the particular scheme or, or set out within the act. So each year, um, you know, a, certain rules are adopted for, for the running of the scheme and the trustees obviously are the ones who are entrusted with fiduciary duties in order to make sure that those those particular rules are, are put in place. Now, as we can imagine, there probably has been an impact in you know the living arrangements or sometimes even how the uh, particular sectional title is run because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and of course in our case the shutdown. I think firstly let's just look at the impact for example on things like the annual general meetings, there are probably um, certain uh, complexes that had scheduled AGMs during this period. You know, would you advise that they either move out that particular AGM? Uh, I mean, I know that there are certain, um, I mean, a lot of them would have more likely, more often than not, communicated it by now, because I think you're given notice around when it happens, so it's pretty standard. I know there are rules and regulations around where it should be happening and the fact that for example if you don't correlate the first time around you must meet the same place same time you know the following yeah. week so how do we then navigate that kind of setup when um there's also a legislative framework that essentially helps us especially because some of the decisions that the trustees are going to be making um obviously have financial uh, implications and so it's not just about their particular apartments but it's essentially managing quite a big budget um, of the particular complex or estate. Yeah, so, so I think, um, you know, we've got to look at two, two sort of periods if, if we're looking at, at the circumstances. Obviously, we've, we've gone through now a period of lockdown where essentially the, you know, gatherings of, of people was, was prohibited 
and it was prohibited, you know, with, with the enforceability of a criminal offense if that happened. Um, and we've seen certain people who've, who've had, you know, social gatherings with multiple people and they've got in quite a lot of trouble with the police for it. So during this period of lockdown, um, you know, I, I, I would hate to hear that there were any formal AGMs that occurred. Obviously, if there was a notice that an AGM was going to occur during this lockdown period, you know, unfortunately for all of us, the, the lockdown sort of got sprung on us. So, um, so it's completely reasonable that those, those particular AGMs didn't happen. Um, we then have to consider that going forward, obviously, when it comes to the first of next month, we seem to be moving into a different phase of, um, of this whole situation for, for COVID. Um, the, the important thing is at this stage, we are, you know, on, on the basis of the president's address, which happened last Thursday, we're now waiting for regulations on the five stages that he set out for, for our plan for COVID going forward. Um, and we're waiting for those regulations to be gazetted because then we'll know exactly what the movement restrictions are on individuals, okay, and how we can we can move going forward. So once those are gazetted, we'll have a, a better idea of can we hold AGMs, you know, in person, um, and and when can we do it. Um, the the important factor which um, which needs to be taken from the uh, the president's address is. In his address, what he said is that um, they are going to place the, the five level restrictions, okay, down to a, a, a metropolitan level, okay. So it's not going to be that he did say that there is a, you know, there'll be a, a nationwide level that we're sitting at. We're sitting at a level four and that has certain restrictions, but it's going to go down to metropolitans and districts, that, that detail. So what needs to be remembered is, you know, What's going to happen for a sectional title scheme, perhaps in Johannesburg, might not be the same for a sectional title scheme in Cape Town. Okay, those those two things can differ widely, so that needs to be taken into account. But you know, if it comes to when it comes to AGMs, um, you know, if if an AGM was supposed to happen during this lockdown period, or you know, perhaps it was intended to happen within the next month. Um, you know, an option is obviously for, for the managing agents, for the trustees to push that out a little bit further. Okay. Um, again, we don't know how long this, you know, these certain levels are going to apply for. So you obviously it's, uh, you know, the managing agents, trustees, you don't want to push out your AGMs for as long as possible. Okay. If it pushes out a little bit, not really going to be a problem. What the other option is, if we do a, a reading of the sectional title schemes management plan, and specifically uh, section 6.1 of the, of the particular act. Now that's the act that obviously regulates how these, uh, the body corporates are supposed to function, how the sectional title schemes are supposed to function. Um, the, the meetings of the trustees um, in terms of 6.1 need to take place at such a time and in such a form as determined by the body corporates. Okay, so, so it doesn't actually require there that it is a personal, you know, people coming together on their feet. It does actually have scope for form of the, the general meeting. Um, and then obviously, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, for, for most managing agents, it's a, a common practice. Now, in terms of section 6.4, um, you know, to send out notices to the, the relative owners of the scheme uh, via email in order to, to let them know the time and, and where it's going to be held. So I think actually there is there's some scope for, for managing agents, body corporates to actually accommodate their uh, owners within the scheme, you know, and hold an AGM via Zoom or, or some other electronic platform. Um, but I think we've, we've all become very familiar with Zoom at this point. So, so that might be a, a viable way in order to, to do your AGM to pass all these, uh, these, you know, these things. Again, uh, my only warning with something like that would be, you do have to take into account your particular scheme uh, and the means that that uh, may be available to the particular owners in your particular scheme. You know, um, you you might have many owners who can who can you know attend a Zoom meeting and you'll meet your quorum, uh, which which should be effective. If you're not going to have that, you don't have people in the particular body corporate who are going to be able to attend a Zoom meeting. Um, and you know this, you know, you're not going to reach a quorum. And then, as you say, you're going to have to 
call another meeting at a later stage. Um, so that might be a, a circumstance where you, perhaps you want to push out your meeting instead of uh, trying to conduct it. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you on that, Nicholas, you know, around the issues of quorum. I mean, I know with so many um, sectional title schemes, there's always complaints around how um, owners in particular schemes typically don't attend um, the AGMs. Uh, and more often than not, we, we tend to struggle to, to meet quorum. I mean, curating is such a struggle. Um, mm -hmm. that you will meet that first time and then you obviously schedule the meeting for the same time the following week and mm -hmm. you know the week passes and it's usually the same usual suspects um, and so people still don't pitch up so in the event where you know you don't correlate in that first meeting are we still going to be using the same principle where you know are we waiting for each other for 30 minutes in that zoom meeting like we typically would in um, in, in, in like a face-to-face -face meeting and should we not correlate? are we then essentially rescheduling let's say another digital um, AGM or meeting for the following week same time we'll still send out the link um, just to make sure that uh, we kind of tick those boxes that we essentially know that we're supposed to be ticking. Yeah so so that would be my, my exact suggestion um, you know obviously the the sectional title schemes management act wasn't drafted with this sort of circumstance yes. that we're in, in mind. Yeah. So, so the, the act does allow for the form of the meetings to be dictated by the trustees for the body corporate. Um, and so uh, really what, what you do is exactly that. Call your first meeting, see if you do have a quorum. Obviously, um, you, you still need to meet your, your quorum requirements in order for, for any substantial decisions to be made. Um, that's, that's just, you're not gonna get around that. So if that quorum isn't made, Again, arrange your, your secondary meeting a week later, um, and then and then move on from that from that position. Uh, I got to say, I did have a, a debate with a couple of attorneys from my offices, and uh, you know we've always we we do understand the problem with trying to get quorum, um, you know, from people coming to to the meetings. I think you might actually have a, a better chance if you're doing it electronically now. Hopefully, I think. Uh, I mean. I I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate that none of the, the properties I'm in right now uh, will have an AGM in the near future. We usually have it towards the end of the year, but I know that we do typically struggle with, with quorum. So it is one of those very contentious issues. And those of us who attend you know, regularly end up almost budgeting that we're not going to meet quorum the first time around. So we have to essentially block off the following week's uh, date and time or, the moment we sure. get uh, the request because we know it's just not going to correct. Uh, so if you're just joining us at home, this is of course a private, private property podcast. I'm on the line with Nicholas uh, Brody, who is the financial director at SLLR. And we're talking about the impact that COVID-19 has had on sectional title schemes. So whether if you are part of a sectional title scheme or have a property in a sectional title scheme and you've got any questions for us, do send them through on Facebook and we'll be sure to address some of your questions. Now, Nicholas, of course, the other contentious issue um, that comes up when you talk about sectional title schemes in light of the, the COVID-19 and especially our lockdown is around the use of the common area. I mean, I've been seeing so many different social media posts um, from people who sometimes are complaining that in their complex, they're not allowed to be using the common area to exercise or whatever the case is. Um, and because the reality is not all types of uh, properties, you have your own little yard. So typically, I mean, with some, you don't actually have a tiny yard. Um, or if you do, it's only the guys who are on the ground floor, everybody else. I mean, I'm on the top floor. So we don't really have our own little yard space to do whatever that we wanted to do. What's the, the I'll say the framework or the legislative framework that body corporates while working with, of course, the managing companies can or cannot say to the, the, the people who live in a complex um, around what can or can't be done. Because I think I, I, a part of me is very sympathetic to, to both sides. I mean, on the one end, this is the yard that you're staying in. So you'd like to be able to have full use of it. However, on the other end, in the event where you get exposed to COVID and you're using the common area and walking around, you know, you're almost increasing the likelihood of spreading it in that particular complex. So it's, it's, it's a tricky one, um, but I think I'd, I'd like us to understand uh, what, what the legislative framework, uh, especially to guide whether it's trustees or people who live in complexes, 
who part can or can't be done by their body corporates and the managing companies that um, run their complexes? Yeah, yeah no, and uh, it's a good question. It's a tricky one. It's one we've been debating thoroughly over the last couple of weeks um, because obviously there, there's been no uh, direct directive which has been made by government in respect of sectional title schemes. Um, and, and it would you know, it'd be impossible for them to have made a directive specifically for your sectional title schemes. You've got to remember every sectional scheme is different. Yes. Um, you know, common areas are different. Exclusive use areas are different. It's, it's impossible to create a directive that would apply to every, um, you know, every sectional scheme fairly or, or properly. Um, so so there's, no, there's no overriding legislative uh, indication in, in that respect. But where we sort of come down on the argument has always been, well, the, the direction that's been given from government at all times is that people must please stay in their homes. Um, it's, and, and, and that for us sort of lends itself to the fact that people must stay within their actual home. Now, uh, obviously the, the arguments on the other side is, but I'm a part owner of the common property of the, uh, you know, within the scheme. For me, that's, that's simply, you know, yes, absolutely you can own it, but that doesn't make it your home direct. And as far as all the regulations that have been, have been undertaken so far, and uh, obviously we've been looking at the, the draft regulations for, for going forward in the, in the various stages, even though they're still in a, in a position where they are subject to change. Um, the, the indications at, at each level is, well, you need to stay within your home as much as is possible. Um, so, so my advice for my, uh, for my clients and, and uh, you know, body corporates is really, you know, try, try and avoid people using the, uh, the, the common area completely. I don't think it's, um, I, I don't think it's in compliance if, if everyone can walk around the, the common property. You know, you might end up with a situation where now you've got a whole bunch of your, your people within your scheme who are now, you know, in a social context within the, uh, the common property. And like you've rightly pointed out, I think that's, that's entirely against what the, uh, the principles that government has, has issued, you know, to social distance people to try and stop the spread. So um, for, for us, I think, I think in government saying, please stay within your homes, uh, obviously that's, that's not a, a direct, you cannot use the common property, but I think it's clear enough that uh, people should stay within their homes and not use the, uh, the common property as much as possible. And the last one on the issue of common property and perhaps what they can or cannot do. And I know this is, this may sound like one of those questions that I probably shouldn't be asking given the fact that we're in a lockdown, but I've seen some uh, very interesting activity on social media. Um, but things like people visiting, right? So, I mean, mm. obviously I think a lot of the security at, the, at our gates have probably been given a directive that you cannot let visitors in because we're essentially in the middle of a lockdown. Why are people even coming to visit? Um, so just understanding things like visitors, but also delivery. So, I mean, a lot of us are probably making use of um, ordering, whether it's our groceries or even medicine online and having them delivered. And I think one of the measures that are probably trying to be put in place is not having delivery, the delivery guys physically getting into the complex, which typically they probably would, you just give them a code, but now people literally waiting at the door and you say, I mean, waiting at the gate and you essentially have to come all the way up to the gate. Um, we're not letting people in. Is that a reasonable thing that, um, you know, the body corporate can make a decision on to say that we're only letting people that we know live here in and obviously these would be people who have access, whether it's via the access card or whichever way that you access your particular complex or estate and ensuring that no outsiders essentially drive in as much as possible to try and contain um, movement in the, in the complex or the estate. Yeah, so, so I think uh, there, there are two sort of elements to that. The, the first one being visitors for people in sectional schemes. Now, uh, in, in respect of those particular circumstances, I mean, the, the lockdown is, is basically put in place so that people don't move at all, mm. okay? So when it comes to people who are visiting a, a particular um, sectional scheme, um, there, there I actually, you know, I, I, my opinion is security should stop them, okay? Uh, again, you're going to, those people are invariably going to go through your common property um, and, and that becomes a problem. Um, 
so so for them i think you know lockdown's quite clear people shouldn't be moving and that would include any visitors to the particular city when it comes down to people who are doing deliveries it's a little bit different because obviously um, provision has been made during the period of lockdown for those who are delivering essential goods um, and obviously what one would presume is that anyone who's delivering uh, goods to a particular premises, it, number one, it's going to be an essential good um, that's actually been delivered. And number two, it's going to be delivered by a vendor that uh, is authorized. to do something. Obviously, there's a licensing process that's going on in the background, allowing people to deliver essential goods. And, and, and you want that, that uh, particular individual to, to actually have the licensing to do so. In those circumstances, obviously, there's there's no way to to stop them. That those essential goods, you know, there's a license. It's they're allowed to be delivered. Again, when it comes to well, what's the logistics of the particular body corporate? Do they stop at the uh, you know the security gate? Are they allowed access into the particular you know into the particular complex to come drop it off at the house um, or or at the door? Um, you know, again, it comes down to well. What is your, what's the structure of your particular sectional scheme? You know, if, you, if you're a sectional scheme with four people, um, you know, it might be quite easy. You might be quite close to your security gates or, or whatever the case is. But obviously we need to be cognizant of the fact that there are homeowners associations or sectional schemes out there with thousands of units uh, mm -hmm. contained within it. So, you know, trying to keep everyone's essential goods at what would be a security desk um, on entering into that complex may be a logistical nightmare, to be honest. Um, and you may end up, you know, hampering the, the situation when you've got lots of people coming to the security um, to come pick up their stuff every day. So, so while, while deliveries of those essential goods should really be allowed, um, I think, you know, we've, we've got to be practical about how exactly people get those particular items. Um, but, but again, you know, the the real crux here is obviously when it comes to the the trustees they they've got a fiduciary duty to obviously mm -hmm. act you know act properly in in uh, in light of their duties for the body corporate and those fiduciary duties will include obviously compliance with the regulations the government has put in place so we do need to be cognizant of the fact that the body corporate really has to try and make sure you know when visitors for for visitors purposes no they, they really should be restricted access into the, into the particular complex. And of course then, uh, Nicholas, you know, the, the third aspect is probably going to be around money. Uh, and, and, you know, some of the questions are already coming in at home. So if you've got any questions around, uh, you know, sectional titles and the COVID-19 crisis, do send them through. I'm with uh, Nicholas Brody, who is the financial director at SLLR. And we're trying to, you know, help each other out and help each other figure it out, you know, what's the best way to, to, to manage it in the event where you're either living in a sectional title scheme or perhaps you've got a few properties properties in a sectional title scheme. So you've got tenants that you must probably extend this particular message to because the, you know, the managing company would have sent communication from the trustees. So that message also needs to essentially filter down to your respective tenants. Um, before I get to some of the questions that uh, we've been asked from the people, the viewers who are watching us at home, I actually have the last one around levies, right? Because I mean, I think a lot of us have been talking about the impact of this pandemic on our pockets. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people losing their jobs, we're seeing a lot of people experiencing salary cuts and having really serious conversations around which bills are going to be paid, um, which items are not going to be paid. I mean, previously, uh, just on Friday, we had a, uh, somebody from APSA who was even talking to us about some of the relief um, that APSA Bank has actually has for their homeowners um, or clients for their homeowners. And so really looking at, you know, how do we then almost work around the fact that we have to obviously pay for levies and sometimes depending on how the system in your particular section of title scheme runs you're also paying for water you're also paying for electricity those items are not prepaid um, and typically when you're going to be paying late or when you're in arrears you're already getting you know letters of demand or late payment letters 
um, from the from the managing companies, I think by like the seventh or whatever the case is, they're already being sent out. So how can we then essentially navigate that? You know, can is there a way that you can almost have a conversation with the managing company? Um, you know, what can the trustees do to try and be proactive about it? Because we must almost anticipate that it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And I'm sure um, in some sectional titles, it's already happened, um, where you almost need to know or anticipate that there are going to be accounts in arrears. And it very likely may not be one month. So in the event where people have paid for April, May is going to be tricky. I mean, we've already seen numbers around, um, you know, a lot of tenants not paying their their April rent already May we know the May rental I mean next week is probably going to be a bloodbath for for landlords so how do we then you know have a conversation around uh, levy payments uh, with our managing companies yeah so uh, again it's a it's a tricky question the you know the essential the essential and hard position is obviously uh, as long as you're an owner their levies are payable um, that that's the overriding provision so you know, I need to address it because there's been a lot of things that go around where say, you know, saying, for instance, rental levies aren't payable during this period. The the fact is they're still payable during this period. However, you know, everyone's got to be cognizant of the fact that, as you say, we're, we're going through a very hard time. You know, people are taking, you know, hits to their salaries, perhaps not being paid at all. Um, and I think what's what's best in the circumstances is obviously where there's uncertainty, the best thing to do is, is have good communication. Um, and I've already seen it with a the, with the couple of my uh, body corporate clients that I've got, where obviously there are some owners within the scheme are experiencing problems, they're experiencing, you know, less uh, lesser pay. Um, and, and what you should really do is, is take it on yourself to then communicate this to, to the particular trustees. Um, you know, as I say, there, there's no overriding legislative provision which you can rely on to say that you, you can have a remission. But I think clear communication to the body corporate in order to say, well, guys, look, I'm now receiving less, less salary than, than I normally do. Um, if you are receiving less salary, make sure you've got, you know, a, a letter from an employer which, which sets that out um, so that you can provide that to the managing agent, to the trustees, um, and then try and have good communication with them in order to come to an arrangement for, for you know, maybe a reduced payment during this period um, and catch it up at a later stage. As, again, it's really gonna depend on, on your particular circumstances. So everyone's got different circumstances. So the only way that you can navigate this um, is to have good communication with, with the, uh, the managing agent and uh, with, the, with the trustees themselves to see where an arrangement can be made for, for catching up on those particular levies if you are struggling to pay. Some, question in, uh, some questions coming in from our viewers at home. Uh, of course, if you've got any questions, do send them through and Nicholas and myself will address them. We've got one coming in from Durrell Jafta and uh, the question is, are property management um, allowed to charge you interest on overdue levies? Uh, the HOA has changed twice in a year and the previous property management company did not perform and never charged interest on overdue accounts. We stopped paying as there were unethical things happening. And they've got a second question. I'll ask the second question just shortly. So let's first rather just deal with that one. Sure. So um, you said uh, HOA there. So that's a homeowners association. Now, the trick of the homeowners association is it's different to a body corporate. Um, in that a body corporate is regulated by legislation directly. Okay, so sectional title schemes management act um, basically regulates the establishment um, until such time as, as the body corporate itself implements conduct rules um, for the running of the particular scheme. Homeowners association is different in, the, the, in that that is a company. Okay, uh, most of the time a nonprofit company which is then uh, established. Okay. And it has its memorandum of, of incorporation or articles of association, which govern how everything works in that particular scheme. Now, what you'll find in most of those uh, articles of association or memorandum of incorporation is that there is a provision for interest um, to be charged on arrear accounts, or alternatively, if it's not sitting within those particular documents, then a resolution is taken. So the, uh, the Articles of Association will allow for resolutions to be taken by um, essentially what would be the directors who, who can make decisions for the running of the Homeowners Association. 
um, and a resolution for interest may have been taken. In those circumstances, um, provided obviously that the that everything is, is done correctly in respect to the resolution or whatever the case is, then interest can be charged on, on those particular amounts. Um, but again, that's a very it's a very specific circumstance because obviously every company's articles of association or memorandum of incorporation um, will differ quite widely. So you know, yes, but but there's a big proviso on there on I don't know what the, the content of your particular homeowners association documents say. And, and the second aspect um, of Joel's question is, uh, secondly, what should the correct levy be for a complex, a reasonable value to have um, a functional complex? It's, <laughs> it's, that's uh, very difficult to very answer. Difficult. Because, uh, you know, uh, where, where's the complex located that would affect obviously the, the property rates? You know how many how many owners do you have in your particular scheme? Uh, you know what what insurance are you are, do you have to cover? Um, unfortunately, that's a, a, that's a bit of an open ended question, so I, I can't really answer it with uh, with any real clarity. Yeah, it is a very contagious one. I mean, I mean, oftentimes I've seen certain complexes where uh, levies are as high as six, seven thousand rands. Um, and people are paying that very comfortably and they think they're getting value for money. Uh, whereas, you know, there are other areas where levies are 1,000, 1 1.2. So it really does vary from, you know, complex or estate to estate. And there are different considerations to the amount that ends up, you know, being decided on by the corporate or the trustees. Um, another, another question, and this one, <laughs> I think it's also quite a, an open-ended one. Um, and it is, is it worth purchasing a home in a complex? Uh, sorry, did you say, is it worth purchasing a home? Yes, yeah, in a complex. Yeah, also, also a bit of an open-ended question. Look, yes, um, uh, you know, th there's certain benefits um, and, and that, that come with owning a, a particular home in a complex. Um, the, the great thing about, about sectional schemes is, you know, up until the act was actually enacted, you could only buy full title properties and multiple people were essentially sort of restricted from, from living, you know, in a, in a particular full title property. There are benefits that stem from a, a sectional title scheme. Obviously, you have multiple owners in the scheme that all share with, uh, with the costs of running that particular scheme. Um, so that you can pay, you know, low levies in theory, low levies for for the continued running of the of the particular scheme. There are there are definite benefits for 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 a scheme, and and you know, for first time owners, if you are a first time buyer, um, obviously the price range that you're looking for something in a sectional scheme is something that's achievable compared to a free freeholding stand, um, which you know, the which are much more expensive depending on on where you're looking. Um, but obviously, with with the ability to buy your your sectional scheme, there are also obligations which you must meet. So if you are buying a property in a sectional scheme, make sure you check the uh, conduct rules for the particular scheme. You know, make sure you check the financials. What exactly you're going to get yourself into? What are the levies that you're going to be expected to pay once you've actually purchased that uh, property? And if you ask the managing agent or, or the sales agent of that particular unit, um, they should be able to give you all that information. So really, you know, is it, is it good buying a, a, a sectional scheme property? Yes, but uh, you, you do need to do a little bit of research when buying the property, just to make sure you're getting into something that you can handle um, because you're gonna be paying levies going forward from the month that you, you've actually purchased. And it's such an important one, Nicholas. I think so many of us, when we started in our property ladder and probably bought into a sectional scheme, uh, very likely didn't know that we had to ask the estate agent, uh, you know, for, for financials to get a sense of how well that particular sectional title is being run and also get a sense of how much levies are. And if at the moment that you're buying, there's a special levy, because uh, it could very well that you're buying just after they've resolved that they're going to have a special levy. It's going to be 2000 Rand. It's going to run for 18 months and you've done all your calculations and you are not anticipating that additional, you know, 2000 Rand for a special levy. So being able to understand those dynamics um, when you're, 
purchasing a property, but also once you're in the scheme, that there are those times where you might raise a special levy in order to do whatever you know infrastructure project that the complex might want to um, you know invest in or do is so crucial because if anything you end up finding yourself in the worst financial um, situation because you didn't quite anticipate that that's going to be an additional cost to the home ownership. Uh, now, Nicholas, before I let you go, any other tips, insights that you'd like to share with us for our viewers at home who are either staying in sectional titles or um, owners um, of apartments in sectional titles, particularly during this period? I think it, it's so important for us to try and get a sense of just how wide the impact of you know, the COVID-19 crisis is in our lives, that it isn't just about us staying at home, but it's affecting the whole property sector and different players within the value chain. And all of us kind of want to find different ways that we can, um, I suppose, navigate this and also be able to, to find some kind of comfort in knowing that perhaps these are the best things that we can do or these are some of the things we probably shouldn't be doing during this period. No, it's, uh... I think it's a little bit of what I said earlier with regards to, you know, payments of levies. It's, it's really, at, at the end of the day, obviously, these are unprecedented times and, and it's something that we've never experienced in our lives before. Um, and, and really, when it comes down to something like that, the best thing is communicate. Um, you know, communicate with, with your trustees if there's a problem. Um, you know, make sure you let them know what's going on in, in your particular circumstances, because we all have different circumstances that we're dealing with. And we're all, you know, under the same burden here. We're all struggling uh, a little bit. And, and the only way that, that you're going to be helped is if you communicate effectively with people. So make sure you communicate, uh, make sure you are, are trying to get as much information as possible. Obviously the, uh, the address from the president of, of uh, last week, Basically, we're, we're expecting this week for a whole bunch of regulations to be put in place with regards to, you know, who can work, how they can work, our, our personal movement, um, and, and all of those things are going to have a big impact on, on what happens, and, and that's expected to come in during the course of this week. Um, so make sure you, you, you keep yourself updated on exactly what information is coming out. Be careful for information that is, that is not actually correct. Um, because there are a lot of things flying around. I mean, within five minutes of the president's speech last week, I had received about 30 different uh, levels for, for the restrictions that are going to be in place. And I don't know if any of them are true. In mm. fact, I know none of them are because the regulations have not been gazetted yet. So make sure you, you use viable sources, okay, um, for your information, but mostly communicate with each other. Um, I think this really is a time for, for you know, human beings to, to, you know, sort of work together to try and get through these problems uh, and, and communication is how we're going to do that. Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think this was so insightful. As somebody who lives in a sectional title, but also has uh, different properties in sectional titles, I've also found it to be quite useful. Uh, I think a lot of the you know, trustees and even the management companies have tried to be as proactive in communicating the message. I think with some of our uh, management companies, they've actually you know, preemptively sent us communication pre-lockdown to say they will be working, they'll be remote, this is how we can reach them. And just really trying to make sure that we are at ease as we try to make sense of you know, the lockdown. And now, I mean, a lot of us don't even know how long this is going to be. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Andres, thank you for having me. And that was Nicholas Brody, who is the financial director at SLLR. And we're talking about the impact that the COVID-19 crisis has on sectional title schemes. And of course, if you have any more um, you know, questions or you'd like to, uh, you'd like us to ask to answer some of those um, questions or your comments, you can always leave them down below and we'll be sure to address them. And if you want to be reading up on some of the tips to help you navigate, uh, you know, being at home or understanding the home ownership journey, you can always go to our website, www.privateproperty.co.za. And of course, we'll be back again tomorrow evening at seven o'clock for more on the Private Property Podcast. I've been your host, Zamandunga Kumalo. Thank you very much for joining us. Hope you're staying home and you're staying safe. Until tomorrow evening, goodbye.